Welcome to ALD Stories, a series chronicling the personal journeys of the people behind atomic layer deposition, untold stories of the technology, and deep dives into the history, development, and future of ALD. I'm your host, Tyler Myers, bringing you this podcast from Benick, the home of ALD. In this episode of ALD Stories, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Harm Knopes. Harm has an interesting role at the intersection of academia and industry with a joint appointment at Eindhoven University and Oxford Instruments Plasma Technologies. At Oxford, Harm is an atomic scale specialist where he routinely advises on processes in ALD, ALE, and 2D materials while informing their work with supplemental research at Eindhoven. Here, Harm and I have a fantastic wide range of conversation from careers in ALD to plasma conformality. We talk about alternative careers to the traditional industry and academia binary, how scientists can leverage their technical knowledge outside of the lab, and how working in a cross-institute position makes for efficient science. We also touch on Harm's work with plasmas, tackle misconception about plasma conformality, and how Harm approaches learning new topics. I once again must thank Harm for his time and generosity in recording this episode. He has a lot of things cooking, so please grab your tea or coffee and enjoy Oxford Instruments and Nine Hovens Harm Knops. But yeah, I just had to run over and get one last cup of coffee. Today is just uh it's been a long, long day full of meetings, but this is a good way to end it. I, I had I was slightly worried about my voice in the sense that I mean it's I think it's fine, but I had to give part of a lecture and then had long presentation where I was basically constantly talking and I was like, okay, I hope it's but uh, I have a nice chamomile tea here, so it should be fine. You think, yeah, you need to do the like uh singer kind of Voice exercise. Yeah, we should voice tell. Voice. Yeah, yeah, I never do, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, cool. Well, hey, Harm, thank you for coming on to the AOD Stories podcast. It's really exciting to have you here. We have, in case anybody didn't listen to the introduction today, Harm Knopes from Eindhoven University and Oxford Instruments. So, Harm, again, thank you for coming on and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on the podcast, uh, Tyler. It's uh, very nice to be here. So yeah, we have a few kind of interesting topics, I think, to talk about today. I mean, one mostly being about your you know, dual role here at Oxford and then Eindhoven, kind of at the nexus of this academia and, and industry. And, and we'll talk a bit about some of your, your work in the past as well, maybe some things from your, your time at Argonne. But maybe before we get into, into too much detail, maybe you can just give us a, a little bit of, of background on yourself where you are today and a little bit of just uh yeah little notes on your your roles yeah sure so my current role is i work for oxford instruments and also part-time for the eindhoven university so i'm an atomic scale segment specialist for oxford instruments so um yeah looking at ALD, ALD and 2d materials and then i work one day a week for the eindhoven university uh, as an assistant professor uh, in the group of Erwin Castles, which you, I think you also had here on uh, on the show. Um, and looking into ALD in general, plasma ALD, and nowadays and also ALE and 2D materials. Um, yeah, and really, yeah, having this mix of being with one foot in academia, but also being an industry. I mean, a very technical role in the industry, of course. So I'm not a manager in that sense, or I'm not, uh, but uh, yeah, you do get also involved, of course, in uh discussions uh which are more related to commercial or customer uh, situations great so before we go into the kind of relationship with this role and i've talked to erwin before and uh, i've talked to many of you at, at eindhoven at this point whether it's been on the podcast or outside but it feels like working in erwin kessel's group or with erwin ends up being a kind of fast tracked to being a professor <laughs> all nine hope <laughs> is there some conspiracy here does you know is there, there might you know, be a, as a new, new student there's like okay now we need to have a new professor role sometime <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting question so i think there is definitely this difference i think between how things go in us and how things go in europe so and my my impression is in the us is much more individual pis and smaller groups and in europe it's a bit more almost like a tree where you have a big research group which kind of sub PIs within that group. And in such ecosystems, when you find your niche and you do well, you I think you can do pretty well if you um, yeah, find your role there. So one thing 
uh, and I might come back to the, that in, in general. So I never, what I, I, I didn't do in a very strategic sense, I never went for like a postdoc uh, abroad, uh, these kind of things, which I think should have been good for an academic career. So I think partly why I was able to get a part-time academic career is also because it's part-time. I think for a full-time academic career, I think it would be good to have some a bit more abroad experience. I have a broad experience, but it's a bit fragmented. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So I think, yeah, we, as a group, so I think Erwin is good in being strategic. He's, I think, good in selecting people. He's good in creating good atmosphere. I think everybody else in the group also contributes to that. So maybe even balance it out. You know, Erwin is very focused and, uh, to an extent a workaholic. So, uh, we try to make sure that there's also a lot of fun in the group. And I think that's also why people enjoy being in the group. And I actually enjoy also, I, I live in Eindhoven, I live in the Netherlands. Um, I work for a British company, which I also really enjoy, but having a place where you can go and have a coffee without having to leave the country, uh, I think is quite nice. So uh, no, I really enjoy that. And Scott, I mean, Eindhoven is in some ways a, an enormous hub for this work in, in any case, right? ASML is there, you have the the university, um, and you're not actually that far away from like IMEC and these types of yeah. things. So the yeah. whole area is pretty well set up for having a career <laughs> in this work. Yeah, I, I tell students, so uh, I'm involved also a bit in guiding. I'm not so, I'm, I, there's one lecture I get, I am involved in once a year, a lecture given by Adrian Marcus and Erwin Castles on plasma processing. Um, I then give one of the lecture actually on deposition. So I talk about sputtering, PCVD, but also ALD and plasma ALD and try let the, try to get students to understand the service processes. But the um, uh, one of my main things I do for university is help to guide uh, postdocs and, and PCs. So I have one PC I'm guiding directly and several where I'm involved with. But then I tell people also, even if in the ALD scene you don't like it or if university don't like it, you can always go to ASML because it's right next door and they're all always looking for good people. So yeah, that's a, a good environment. And and there's lots of other companies, I think, as well. So it's a good uh, ecosystem indeed. I will you know, eventually work my way through everything <laughs> in the Netherlands uh, to my technique. I take me some time. You never know. You might end up at ASMA at a certain point. <laughs> I, I, that would be incredible <laughs> if somebody from, on the, from there would want to come on. They, then that would be the most like we have to keep things below the belts, uh, things confidential. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do. I'm, I must admit that I like being part of academia and I also like that I'm mostly, also for Oxford, I'm mostly involved with the research side. So they have both research and production customers. I'm mostly involved in the research side. And I like that level of being able to be relatively open. One of the metrics is be able, oh, could we get a nice paper out of this? Could we understand it? And then I do see also with friends of me that works at Ismail, then it becomes much more, okay, there's so much money involved. Yeah, then yeah, of course the level of secrecy and such becomes very high. Uh, so then you're one day at Eindhoven, you're, you're four days at Oxford. So most of your time is spent in interfacing with the people at Oxford. Yeah. And so what does your kind of kind of day look like in the atomic scale specialist role? Uh, are you interfacing with sales and process teams a lot? Are you mostly talking about work that you are completing at Eindhoven to support Oxford? How does that go? I think that last one is a big one. So they work a lot together with Eindhoven, which I think is all clear from uh, also a lot of the, the publications and sites and there's a strong collaboration, which then I can help. Yeah. Also make sure that both sides benefit from this and also point out to people, well, what is nice. Um, and so many discussions with people for at TUE, uh, Eindhoven university or people at Oxford would be about, do we understand this process? There might be a certain process that we think, oh, the uniformity or the properties could be better. So trying to understand that it could be talking about a project. So I'm not actually only involved with the Eindhoven uh, collaboration, but also with some other, so, uh, AMO and, and some other uh, places where we collaborate, uh, with, so me being between academia and industry also gives me a good perspective on what would academic people be interested in a collaboration. Also, what would industry people be interested in a collaboration? So I think that always helps me to make sure that these things yeah, actually can, yeah, are beneficial for both sides and yeah, trying to get new projects, new collaborations 
you mentioned being close to iMac and Leuve, so uh, we're involved in some 2D materials things. So then I go uh, to workshops that might be there. Um, so yeah, that's that. If I'm if I'm traveling, I would be going there. I could be involved with customers, could be presenting at a conference or just going to a conference to talk to people or um, explain things. Um, many things, many Teams calls, many emails. So, and that could be global. So, uh, people from Asia, US, um, talking about things. So yeah, I am, I, I kind of try to promote myself, but also I think I'm used as, oh, he is the ALD, one of the ALD specialists, uh, within Oxford Instruments. So if there's a weird material or weird question or a weird effect, that people see, then yeah, I'm often dragged into the discussion and actually I'm happy to be involved in those discussions. So, and that's maybe, um, yeah, looking back at careers in academia, I can imagine if you come from academia and you go work at a company, there is a risk you would, you go in a very, um, ex yeah, a role where you just have to run wafers, but you don't get to study much what's happening. So I would always encourage people to try to keep up with literature, try to come up with hypotheses, uh, theories, why stuff is happening. If you are in the know in the literature, you become known as a person like, oh, let's ask this guy or let's ask that guy. And if, even though people might swamp you with experiments or things, I would try to, yeah, or at least make clear to people, oh, whatever you want in your role or what you're happy with. So I like to work on stuff that is weird and unusual and not understood. So uh, then, yeah, it's good to be, into the knowing the literature and such, I would say. Yeah, it's a really good point, actually. And I know we wanted to talk about kind of career paths in, in general, especially for technical people that, you know, it's always been seen kind of like a binary choice when you're getting a PhD and you're, you're getting really narrow. It's like, okay, you either go be a professor. So go find your postdoc, go find your professorship, or you go to industry and at least in our fields, that means being a process engineer yeah. somewhere. At least, or you at least start out as that. So then it depends, mm -hmm. I think, on what you might become a manager after that, or you become, you go more towards some kind of CTO-like role or something. But it's it always starts, I think, as a process. And maybe weirdly enough, because I was remote, that maybe also made it that they couldn't put me behind the tools too much. <laughs> so that maybe also made it that it was easier for me to keep my eyes in the papers and books and collaborations and such. Right. I think it's yeah, it's hard to to know that like these two linear paths aren't the ones and like, you don't have to take yeah. one of those. Like while you're still getting really narrowed in your PhD, the fact that you have that technical knowledge can be applicable in, in so many different ways. So it's not yeah. just that you're here and then you can go this way. It's really kind of a, a web, a tree of different careers that yeah. you take. And I mean, I think you are a good example of one that sits in the middle of academia and industry, but even in industry like myself, for instance, I am a, a marketing <laughs> manager. I don't do yeah. any research. I don't touch tools at all anymore, but you still, using your technical knowledge, can find a way to communicate how this, tech, or this technology works in a way that's a little more digestible to the people who aren't uh, actually, <laughs> actually involved in that to begin with. So, yeah. And, and then maybe, uh, I think, in this podcast, probably most of people with a technical background. So I think for people with a technical background, it is interesting to know you can basically end up in many positions. You, so I know sales guys that had a technical background, but became sales guys. And actually they're often really good sales guys because they can talk to academics really well. So if you enjoy that, then I think that would actually be, can be an interesting route to go to. If you like indeed. Uh, I enjoy also making nice presentations, making sure that the message is clear. And I can imagine you have something similar. So then something that involves marketing and sometimes involved in those kind of things that I think can be quite a nice, uh, a route as well. And, and also I, I would say, don't worry too much because maybe you end up in a certain role. And if you, if you realize, oh, actually, I don't really enjoy doing this and you could always try to steer it. Yeah. Make sure that you, you're at a company that appreciates appreciates you and that if you then say, oh, I want something different, that you can also go in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're the one who is the expert on these things. So, you know, in the same way that you are in the lab trying to figure out some problem coming up with a creative idea, I think there's a lot of opportunities to be creative around how you just use the skills and the knowledge that you've come up with. And I don't know if I've talked about this many times or at all, 
the podcast before, but for sure during my PhD, I had like a small existential crisis about what I was going to do when I was done. Like I really didn't want to be a professor and I really didn't want to be a process engineer. And I found myself having a kind of small vignette in technology transfer. And it was not having anything to do with ALD. I was working for our, our medical campus actually at the time. And, uh, you know, this is for those who may not be familiar with tech transfer. This is kind of an office at universities that's helped uh, professors and researchers get their technology into industry essentially through patent yeah. licenses is the is the idea. But then that just having you know a year or two of doing that felt like it opened up so many other doors, and nobody really tells you that these types of roles exist. And mm -hmm. I think it's difficult to, to if you don't have the resources to to find something that is going to fit for. For you. Yeah, and I think it's also learning by doing so. I think when I did my BZ, then was still maybe a bit more narrowly focused and then doing postdoc and then I was at least doing some different application fields and then you realize, oh, even each of these application fields has this vast knowledge and ecosystem behind it. Um, and I also wasn't so sure if I wanted to be uh, if one tried to go full professor, I wasn't, I'm, I, I travel quite often for conferences or work, but I don't like to be spend really long time abroad. I spent a few times, like three months abroad, which I enjoyed, but I was always al also always very happy to come back. So I wouldn't be the kind of person that says, oh, if we can get a nice position in the U S or Asia, I would just take it because it's a nice position. I would, uh, I'm a little bit uh, connected to this to region, I would say. Uh, so, uh. Uh, and then I I, uh, I tried to, I, did, I wrote some project proposals seeing, okay, can I go in that route? But some, yeah, actually those project proposals didn't really pan out. And then at certain point, started work for Oxford Instruments. And that, yeah, I think developed into what my role, what my role is today. So now in the split that you have now, do you ever feel you'd like to, you know, shift it more towards being at the university? Do you like the... The I get that I get time. that question. Also, actually, even Oxford is asking, "Oh, would you be interested in working even more for university or not?" Or what? Yeah, they, it's nice actually that they they care that uh, if I'm if I'm doing well. Uh, but actually, I think I kind of like it. So one of the things is Oxford Instruments lends me to university um, uh, for this one day a week, and this is uh, how it's agreed in collaboration. And that means that I don't have kind of double admin because otherwise you have, and also. Academia can be difficult to actually arrange money. So if you're a full-time professor, you have to get often enough projects and you have to defend why you why the university should still pay you. And if the university is not paying you directly, I don't have to worry about it. And I think that would also be a bit ineffective in my role because if I only work one day a week for university and I'm, I spend that one day a week trying to raise funding for myself, that's actually not... I think so beneficial for the collaboration. So I'm, I think we set it up in a clever way. Uh, and if I would do more university, then I think the balance, it might, it probably also would work, but then it becomes risky on, okay, are both sides still benefiting to the right amount or not? So I can, I, yeah, I have the impression that at the moment it, it works well this way, at least. That's great. So then and maybe people might be wondering, how does one day a week at, at a university look like? Do you have yeah? So I, it's, so formally, it's uh, one week, one day a week at university, and and four in uh, in um, four Oxford In reality, because I live in Eindhoven, you could also say it's uh, one fifth of a day, one fifth of the time per day for university, and four fifth uh, for Oxford. And it's also not each week that well uh, defined. So. Many days, I actually, if I don't have to travel or something specific, for Oxford, I would go to university, but then maybe at the university, when I'm working on emails and Teams meeting, that's maybe mostly Oxford Instruments. Uh, but then inter the nice thing is, in, is then that I'm available for discussions with um, PCs and postdocs. And also if they, yeah, they have a lot of Oxford Instruments tools. So if I, if they come across weird things, uh, I, it might be easier worked on the, the same tools basically so i can sometimes even from own, own experience help them or i can hint at at orc and maybe think along why something is a problem or i can realize oh there's a big problem and maybe even signal internally like oh this is a concern we should address and we should look at so i think that's uh 
I, I'm, I'm not, I don't try to be like a service interface because I think that mm-hmm. I always recommend people don't become that because you will, I think for any company, uh, it depends. Yeah. It takes a special kind of character, I think, to, to be that kind of interface. So most academics might not be too happy doing that, but yeah, if you keep it more on the, oh, you're part of the research side, I think that that yeah, can be very nice. You made a really good point earlier in this about, um, kind of knowing what an academic would want to work on and knowing what uh, some of the industry would want to work on. I, I think I come from from a lab with, with Steve George where we were almost exclusively industry collaborations. So there was no kind of worry that, oh, well, we, don't, we don't know what people are going to want because the funding was just coming from them in, in any case. But there are a lot of people working on on fundamental fundamental research, and it, you know their money is coming from SRC or it's coming from coming from government or whatever it might be. And I think it's hard sometimes to know, well, where are people going to use this, or is this as interesting as I think it is? Is it yeah. applicable for industry? So yeah, being plugged in in that way is really efficient, <laughs> I suppose. I know that you have some some interest in, you know, Oxford getting um, information from the research at Einhoven and Einhoven having the projects to, to work on. But uh, of course, having that uh, access <laughs> to that knowledge makes things very, very quick and, and very efficient. We know, okay, this is maybe the, the fastest route to getting something to market or fastest route uh, yeah, and I think- in the research. So one thing I think is the um, uh, the t- I really like actually the, the the type of research that the plasma materials processing group in Eindhoven does in this style. So I think how I would phrase it is that it's it's actually often can be quite fundamental research, but it's very industry oriented. So it's fundamental questions about what's happening actually at the surface, how do certain reactions go. But it's not the kind of blue sky science where people only do the science for the science and they have no clue where it would be useful. It's actually often links quite closely to a pressing problem. I don't know, it could be the conformality of silicon oxide by plasma ALD or something like that, that we try to understand what determines this. And then we look at things like radical recombination and we look in literature and and we also try to challenge our own preconceptions because we sometimes think, ah, oh, this was, yeah, it's uh, maybe a nice route to go in for the next discussion in the conformality of plasma ALD. But yeah, that's really, we, we, yeah, it was maybe different than we expected in the past. And, and it's a very, there's some fundamental questions of what is happening at the source. How does the recombination go? But then when you understand it, and even when you just make an academic paper about it, I think it's, and it's probably used actually, and, and even the, the high end semicon industry, they look at these papers and think, ah, oh, that's interesting. So we could maybe you do this or do that. So it's not only actually for direct Oxfordismus uh, customers, but even industry in general, I think quite uh, useful. And that's actually the kind of fundamental science, which I think uh, I enjoy most is where it's, it's really fundamental but you actually know okay we're also solving a real problem uh here but i actually also think that curiosity based purely like oh that's a weird effect and just going down the rabbit hole and trying to understand it is really good because i see that's maybe my impression sometimes that people who are too focused on the goal they ignore things that they see on the side like oh that was a weird pressure spike or that was a weird temperature thing and then they say oh we don't have time we cannot investigate this but they might actually miss a really important effect that if they would understand it could actually solve the problem there or another problem they're looking at, but maybe in a very indirect way. So by ignoring weird results, uh, yeah, maybe they, they overlook things. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times, well, now I can't think of an example off my head, but sure, so many times in the history of, of science, the things that were going wrong or that went happened by accident or what actually ended up being the main discovery. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it isn't this, this meme, like instead of like uh, Eureka, it's actually, oh, that's odd. That, yeah, is, right. that is the more like a uh, big discovery uh, uh, moment. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, this was a, a good segue then into talking about uh, some some plasma work. If people haven't caught on, you will have Oxford Plasma Technologies as well as being in the Materials of Plasma Processing Group at Eindhoven. So, as everybody can imagine, you are probably working on on plasma things and have worked yeah. on plasma things in the past. And 
with what we were going to discuss today was the idea of conformality in plasma, which people may have many misconceptions about. So I will let you introduce the idea first. Yeah, and I think it's nice to even yeah try to give some historical context. So I think this was in actually I think it was when I started my bachelor project. So like 2005 or so, I was actually working on in the bachelor project on PCVD with biasing, which weirdly is very topical again, but um, but then for ALD. But there were some people in Irma's group, and I think at that time there were like two people working on ALD. It was a, a very small group, and I they were doing some nice simulations. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I, I I wasn't I wasn't involved in the work, but I just I think it was in my same office as I was this kind of student office. And I thought, oh, that's cool. And then later, I think when I came back for my masters. Um, we were working on, on plasma ALD of, I think it was Tantamizer at the time. And at that time, there were really actually a lot of people even questioning whether plasma ALD could be conformal at all. There was there were some few examples where people were kind of doubting it. And there was this conception that, okay, because plasmas have species that, um, that can be lost at surfaces like ions and radicals, that yeah, you couldn't do conformal deposition. And then we were looking at this and I think we in the like first assumption you can kind of assume okay the ions actually the ions can do lots of nice things but let's for the moment ignore the ions and just look at the radicals which are often the main effect okay they can recombine so the o, o radicals can recombine in o2 or hydrogen radicals can recombine in h2 so when they hit a surface they might recombine but that's a certain probability and there's actually some nice really old literature from the 50s or before but people do experiments for completely different reasons than ALD to try to understand this um and it, it determine probabilities, and it depends on the surface. So, an oxygen on a, um, on a cobalt oxide might have a pretty high recombination probability, but on a silica surface, actually, had a really low recombination probability. Only one in ten thousand collisions or so would be lost. Um, and then what we did, I did at that time, and this was during my PhD, so also not working for Oxford Institute. Said I, um, together with uh, Urban and and some others, we were looking at okay, can we at least put our thoughts in a single paper, can I put things together and use the simulation that people had? So I didn't really work on the on the model of the simulation, so that was there, but I just used the model. I ran it in many different conditions and tried to figure out what's happening. And then we saw, okay, I think first of all, we saw like you have diffusion and reaction limited. If you look more in the thermal ALD-like regimes, that, okay, the diffusion could be limiting or the reaction could be limiting. I think it was uh, Jeff Elam who looked at that before and also had it in one of his... Uh, papers and then we also saw that that could be a recombination limited regime where the recombination of the radicals is limited and then we tried to understand okay if it's limited by the recombination what does that mean and it actually typically meant that you could still get conformal deposition as long as you waited long enough but it did mean that long enough could be exponentially long so i think we came to the conclusion that for most oxides like aspect ratio 30 was doable and otherwise it's crazy long and for nitrides it was maybe 10 or 20 or so that's doable um, so basically you have to just wait long enough so that there are enough uh enough radicals that didn't recombine <laughs> yeah. To... yeah yeah so if if every uh if if uh, 90 percent of your radicals recombine towards the bottom but you just wait 10 times longer it's still mm -hmm. sufficient uh so that's uh and then i think we took kind of a measure I don't remember exactly how we did it, but basically saying, okay, let's say you're normally okay with a one second plasma time. You might still be okay with a five second plasma time, but not with a plasma time that's five days or something like that. So if it becomes exponentially weird or longer than that's, yeah, that would be too much. And then that was the, the, that simulation work. And I think that was, yeah, quite good reception. And I remember actually Sean Barry once told me that he used it in one of the lectures and people really liked it. I think that was one of the best compliments. Uh, I once got for that paper, so I was really happy with that, that, that really uh, people enjoyed that. And then um, uh, we had a PC student uh, who finished, um, I think it was last year, or maybe the year before. Yeah, um, Carsten Arts, and he looked a little bit further into this, and he started doing actually some even more uh, simulations and modeling. And we started looking in uh, silicon oxide as an example. And we were using these uh, pillar hole structures which I think VTT uh, made, and I think you had Rika uh, on a few times on the show, which have really nice structures, but typically you would say they're not so nice for 
plasma because right. it is really deep structure. So yeah, if you want to only look at that space for 10, 20, 30, it's not so interesting. But then we saw that for silicon oxide, we came much deeper. So we, we, we went to aspect ratio a few hundred, and I think we even went up to a 900 or so if we did a really long plasma. We were initially we were thinking, okay, we must have done something wrong. This must have been a mistake. Maybe it's water coming out, but actually the silicon oxide process didn't work with water. Maybe it's ozone, but we did some back of the envelope calculations and it was way too low ozone. And then we looked again back on, on, on this literature uh, and we saw, we were actually looking at this recombination probability and on silica, it kind of varied. So it was, we had one paper that was one in 10,000. I think there was even some reports where it's more in the 100,000. So actually on silica, the recombination probability is so low that it can go really deep. So it's still in the end recombination limited, but it's recombination limited when you go to an aspect ratio of a few hundred mm -hmm. or so. So that was weird. It was I think the silicon oxide we figured out the same was for titanium oxide, and actually aluminum oxide was a bit more difficult. There, there it was yeah aspect ratio thirty, maybe fifty could be possible, but we found it kind of surprising because normally you would expect alumina is the easiest material for everything, and here it looked at that for conformality and plasma ALD actually silica and titania would be the easiest uh, materials. And it was yeah, kind of serendipitous, nice discovery. And also nice from comparing to yeah, maybe 10 years ago, where there were still people saying uh, why we wouldn't recommend plasma, why it can never be conformal and these kind of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm not an anti-thermal guy. So I think many cases, if you can do it by thermal ALD, you should do it by thermal ALD. And also Oxford Instruments and Eindhoven does also thermal ALD. Um, but in certain cases, plasma can definitely be a, give a benefit and a lot of interesting physics and chemistry happens. So I'm of course also, yeah, uh, interested in what's, what's going on there. Yeah. I think even now, looking back on when I started in my PhD, I still feel like that misconception is, is still there. Like, like plasma yeah. people are still fighting it a, a little bit that, uh, anyway. I still, I still hear it. Sometimes people say just out of Australia, okay, we don't want plasma because we, we, we want to avoid damage. And actually, some cases you can get damage from plasma. Um, yeah, that's also a really complicated story. And the main answer is it depends. So it depends on many things like the the plasma pressure, the plasma power, and what's happening at the surface and for what kind of device. So graphene is, of course, you can imagine quite sensitive. But even there, we see some cases where you could use plasma. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, yeah, it depends, I would say. I mean, it's just another another knob to turn, right? Yeah. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. You just need to figure out the way that you can use it. Yeah, and still, there might be cases where you say, oh, it's really silly to use plasma here, or it's either no benefit, or it makes things actually really complicated. So, uh, yeah, it's not that you always should use it, but the case where you can use it can be really uh, helpful. Yeah, this this idea of finding you know this recombination probability and how this affects conformality is really you know kind of kind of simple in, in a way. It's yeah. not the most complicated thing in the world that oh you know this is what plasma does and this is how it could affect conformality. Yeah, it's all I think in a sense all these effects were known, so it's not that, but it's how they then play out and what other consequences. I think that's that's uh, a little bit unknown. Did you find any any correlation or reason why? Like chemically or what's happening at the surface, why aluminum oxide was worse in terms of the aspect ratio you could get to versus silica or titania. I think we tried to do it, and it links a bit also to for ozone. We have we did uh, something sim, or we looked at something sim. That it it might be related to how easy it is to reduce an oxide or to change the oxidation state. So silica is really stable and likes to stay silica. Alumina is actually pretty stable. So alumina is relatively easy, so you can go pretty deep. Uh, and for us, something like cobalt oxide and manganese oxide and these kind of oxides, they're really good at changing oxidation states. So you can have MnO, uh, uh, manganese, and you can have MnO2. And you can imagine if you would have an MnO2 and an oxygen radical comes in, it readily would give away that oxygen to become MnO. But if I have SiO2, then it does, it's not so happy to give away that oxygen to become SiO and... Um, or, or yeah, to become, or to become some kind of super oxide to have, yeah. So that's, and I'm, I'm not a chemist, so my background is actually physics. So I, I have often very cartoonish ways of describing things, but uh, I think that's, yeah. I think we, we looked at maybe it's electronegativity or the pH, 
I think the reducibility or yeah, how easy it is to change oxidation state, I think that's a, a good factor uh, of guessing it. And it's often if it's the same family. So, uh, so we know that cobalt oxide can maybe a quite, a, quite a high recombination. So then probably uh, nickel oxide would have a similar behavior because mm -hmm. it's kind of chemically quite similarly behaving. Right. It's funny. Actually, you make a comment about not being a chemist because Sean Barry and I were just having a conversation about uh, the chemistry of, of ALD and how uh, I think people sometimes forget that it is fundamentally <laughs> is a is a chemistry process yeah. that's happening at the surface. I mean, my my friends from grad school was I was also a chemistry chemistry background. They my organic chemic chemist friends that is would always tell me like you are you're not really a chemist and you are just a mechanical engineer building reactors masquerading <laughs> as a as a chemist right now. But it's also just a testament to that there you know there is so much that goes into understanding these processes yeah. in ALD that you know it doesn't take just chemistry, it doesn't take just physics or you know, something about uh, about electronics. Like it is super comprehensive <laughs> to make it, it is also I think process. the type of Chemistry even is is uh, relatively, how you say, also relatively niche. So I've talked to chemists and then I talk about ALD and I know more, then I realize I know much more about the chemistry of ALD than they do because they are purely organic chemists. Mm -hmm. they, so then all this metal organic stuff and all these things at the surfaces and even thinking about that, okay, this stuff happens in a vacuum and, and those kind of surface reactions yeah they're, they're more used to those things happening in solution or those kind of things so um but i do and i it's always nice to have you want i think in the research group you want to have some chemists as well because then i can do like sanity checks okay i wrote it down like this is that okay or am i saying nonsense or yeah, it's, uh... yeah i think even yeah, when i when i started i had my my candidacy exam so it's like second year of my PhD or, or whatever year it was. And uh, yeah, you go and realize, okay, I'm going to be speaking to a committee of chemists. Like, oh, I have to do like some electron pushing and this kind of stuff. Like I actually haven't even thought about this that much because you just think about the, I don't know, you think about the, the leaking exchanges and the, the, the surface chemistry uh, kind of just in a, like the process in a vacuum almost no yeah. pun intended there. So it's like, it's easy to forget that. Oh yeah, this is actually a little bit of chemistry going on, but to, it's kind of, uh, to go back to the, the plasma conformality a little bit. So again, we're talking about the fact that there's this misconception that it can't be conformal or that, you know, it's always going to be damaging. So when you now find some evidence that, okay, you can use plasma for conformal deposition, even in some pretty high aspect ratio structures. Now, what does that open up in terms of, of applications that you can use it for? It's it's interesting because it's, so I think as a researcher and also being in, in industry, and then in industry also means you're often in just a segment of industry. So my impression is that the, like the tier one, very big companies are using uh, a lot of this plasma ALD knowledge actually for uh, actually the, the computer tip. So this double patterning or putting doing gap fill with silicon oxide. And I sometimes wonder maybe they knew all this stuff already, but we're just not telling us to an extent, which is fine as well. Um, but it does, I think, yeah, opens up cases where silicon oxide is such a ubiquitous material. So if you say, oh, I could use silicon oxide, then that I think, um, yeah, whenever people now maybe thought about thermal oxidation or thought about doing PCVD of silicon oxide, I think that's nice. I think for Oxford instruments, of course, we, we have all these different options so we can put them side by side. We can say, oh, if this is your requirement, do PCVD. And if this other thing is your requirement, you can do uh, plasma ALD. So I think that's the benefit. I think, yeah, I, I am sometimes involved both in academia industry and discussion about, oh, we have a certain issue for a device, how can we solve it? And then if somebody needs a really good dielectric with low leakage or needs a material which has a low wet edge rate, yeah, plus my LD, uh, silicon oxide, I think could be a good uh, match to there. So it's it's not that it immediately opens up. I think it will probably down the line open up some things, but now it's more like, hey, we understand this weird effect and how it works and how deep we can actually go. But now we have added some tools to the toolbox. So if now somebody says, okay, I want to do something at really low temperature to have 
an extremely conformal silicon oxide, now they can actually do it. So uh, uh, I'm sure there will come stuff along the way. Right. You know, you have it just in the back of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. When when the opportunity comes, it'll yeah. be yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you are primarily ALD, primary deposition person. Have you thought about ever moving in into Etch? So it was... Um, I think there's also these kind of certain dip at this moment where I'm just involved in discussions and then there's presentations. So I've been moving, I think a few years ago, this was more serendipitous where it was not so intentional, like, oh, let's talk also with Tom Clear for etching. And you have lots of people. It's the kind of two sides. You have people from the, the plasma edge community that are really into ICP etching and look into those depths, uh, but are really plasma people and they don't know much about the ALD. And then from the ALD side, it's mostly, it's a lot of mostly chemists doing thermal ALD and some people doing plasma. And then the ALE does even different flavors. So we have the anisotropic, which is directional, which typically would then use plasma or some other directional species. And you have the isotropic, which goes in all directions, like we expect from ALD also. And that was initially what basically Steve George uh, uh, showed was uh, you could do this with thermal ALE. But we then uh, actually at Eindhoven also thought, okay, couldn't we do this uh, with also an SF6 plasma? Because, okay, they're using HF. People don't really like to use HF, or if you can avoid using HF, that would be nice. Uh, fluorination is the is the key, so maybe it doesn't have to be HF. And then was uh, uh, Nick Chittok, uh, where I'm one of the um, uh, yeah co-promoters, basically, of uh, him. Uh, main promoter would be Adrian Marcus. Uh, so he works on a uh, range of ALE uh, topics, and he showed, uh, we, we are basically showed that we could do with TMA and SF6, we could do basically the same process that Steve George with, did with, but then he did it with TMA and HF. And I think this is opening up a route of kind of isotropic ALE processes. So you're not using the ions of the plasma, we're using the radicals in the plasma, in this case, the fluid. And the real thing is also the plasma is not even the thing that's etching it. The TMA is etching the surface and the plasma is only providing the fluorination uh, of the surface. Um, and that's something we're exploring now, looking at can we do more processes, can we do materials, can we play with the plasma um, conditions and these kind of things. And that's, I think... Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And I'm, I think initially, I, I think I had mentioned my label for Oxford, which is atomic skill, uh, a segment specialist. So I look at ALD, ALE and 2D materials. And I think initially it felt a little bit artificial, like, okay, I'm more or less an ALD guy and not so much an ALE or 2D guy, but I've been more and more involved in also ALE and 2D things that to an extent, I now dare to call myself also an ALE person or a 2D person. So it depends still a bit on the niche. And I'm, for 2D, I'm not good at reading Raman in, uh, scans or something like that. But uh, yeah, this kind of, yeah, the surface science and what's happening at the surface and understanding the process, a lot of parallels in, with ALD, I think, with ALE. And uh, especially if you, you know plasma ALD and what ions can do, then... ALE and what ions can do is relatively natural, actually. How how do you begin to you know get yourself to become at least competent in these in these new areas, right? So specifically, like like two D materials. Obviously, ALE is what you said a lot of parallels. I think yeah. you can you can draw upon a lot of um, previous knowledge from ALD to understand at least on, on some level what's happening in ALE, but I imagine for, for 2D materials, it's starting to become a bit of a, of a departure <laughs> from. Yeah. And I think it takes, it takes initially some small steps. It takes lots of discussion. It takes like you, it's good. You want to know somebody else who is an expert on this. So you can bounce ideas of this person and check if you, uh, and sometimes it just, and that's maybe actually good for a company. You are sometimes put somewhere, oh, we need somebody who has to present uh, on this topic somewhere. And oh, I'll harm you're nearby. Can you present on this? And then they're like, mm, I'm not so sure. And then I say, oh, I could present, but I, I will give a disclaimer. Okay, I'm not an expert on this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, and I, I, I bounce the slides back on somebody else. But then reading up more on this, trying to stick close to something that you are a little bit expert on. So, friends, when I talk about 2D, I talk also a lot about do, growing 2D materials by ALD or nowadays also doing ALE of 2D materials. When it's about 2D materials, I don't 
talk so much about exfoliation or transfer. I talk more about the growth. And then you have CVD processes where CVD, of course, has lots of parallels with ALD as well. So yeah, stick, have some kind of core knowledge that where you're good at and make sure that you foster that core knowledge and then yeah, venture out in other fields. But yeah, I think, I think as long as you disclaim that you're not an expert in something or then usually it's fine. I haven't really, I'm sometimes worried about this, but I haven't really been booed too much or anything like that. So I think mostly it's fine. I think people appreciate when you're, you're forthcoming about what yeah. you don't know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think already quite helpful. That's maybe the main, the main uh, message I would say. Yeah, I guess it's it's in a similar way to when you're just first starting out and okay, how in five years am I going to become an expert on this thing? Yeah. And I think it is it is good to have sometimes like these kind of goals, like oh, I want to become this or I want to I want to be let's say so I uh, after my PC my PC was actually on ALD for batteries, so that was also maybe the first test, and okay, I knew nothing about batteries, so looking into that and then also bouncing these ideas off of that, and I was relatively confident for ALD of, for batteries at that time. I think now I've kind of maybe lost uh, such a vast field. So uh, I've lost maybe a little bit touch there. And then I did a postdoc, which was basically ALD for solar cells. And I knew relatively little about solar cells. We had some courses on solar cells in, in, at the physics department. But also there, yeah, I bouncing ideas, talking to many people. Um, yeah, you, 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 you become more comfortable, at least in a certain niche. So I think we worked on passivation of solar cells, so understanding DIT and fixed charge and uh, 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 passivation in that sense. Um, I think that's, yeah, that often helps. Yeah, don't be, yeah, st stay curious and try to, to, to yeah, look into these uh, fields, I would say. So, um, so then maybe, you know, bring, our, bring us, uh, how would you say, it? maybe to bring us home here <laughs> to the end. What is your, uh, your, your plans, your outlook? Do you, you know, are you, hoping to stay in, in ALD. Do you have some aspirations in some upcoming field that you would like to get into at, at some points? Or is this uh, this it for the foreseeable future? Not to say that this is it in a better. So I think the, I like the kind of the uh, atomic skill segment specialist role. And actually also within TV, I also have kind of that, that role. Um, at the same time, I really, uh, I, I we're recently working again, like on the, a lot of conductive nitrides for the quantum, uh, and I worked on conductive nitrides in my masters and at the beginning of my PhD, and it's still a really exciting topic with a lot of the same problems still, but maybe different solutions. It's uh, so I think the nice thing I'm I'm kind of a person that's happy staying in the same position, but the the world around me constantly changes, and then when there's nice opportunities, I try to take them. So even by trying to stay in the same position i think I, there's constantly stuff changing so uh um yeah this i think the ale and 2d is still yeah maybe two years now or so that i'm looking more into these ones so maybe a little bit longer but yeah it's uh that's i think there's lots of stuff happening there so uh and this combination so i think yeah i i try to think a lot about atomic skill processing and maybe even okay how do we phrase this and how do we understand is that yeah i think that's um one where i think there's still lots and lots of stuff to do so uh, exciting times i would say well it's nice to hear that you find yourself in a position that you're happy in and one that you know is in an environment where it can consistently stay exciting there's always i think so yeah, yeah yeah so yeah yeah i, I like the idea uh, of being in in a spot where you know, every two years, regardless of what you do, there is going to be something new happening. So yeah. you're always going to have something to, to think about that uh, isn't monotonous anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's great. Arma, I think that we have you know, maybe come to, to the end here. Thank you again for your time. This is a really cool conversation. I think for me, uh, it's one I can relate to a lot because it's this kind of... Uh, not so well known path to, to a position, and yeah. you yeah. know, to have people be able to understand that there are different ways you can go about using your technical knowledge and different career paths that you can choose that aren't the the typical ones, and yeah, just to to hear about the the work that you're doing in collaboration with Anhoven and Oxford is really interesting. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for your time. This was really a lot of fun, Harv. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I guess we'll uh, we'll have to try and get you on again, maybe with a 2D 2D uh, materials panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we never know. That's uh, I think uh, that's a uh, that's a nice one to uh, to plan for the future. I would say. Thanks for listening to ALD Stories with Benek. To stay updated on new episodes each month, please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed the show. I hope to see you again in the next one.